Hi everyone, this lesson is on encephalitis. So in this lesson we're going to talk about what causes encephalitis. We're also going to talk about the signs and symptoms, how it's diagnosed, and how it's treated. So encephalitis is a condition involving inflammation of the brain parenchyma. So it is inflammation of the brain tissue. Now encephalitis may be due to a variety of causes. We're going to talk about those causes in the next slide. The incidence of encephalitis, particularly viral encephalitis, which is going to be the most common type of encephalitis, is estimated to affect 3.5 to 7.5 people per 100,000. And it has the highest incidence in young and elderly populations. This is likely due to lower immune system functioning in those age groups. This also ties in with the increased risk of encephalitis in those with immunocompromised. So patients who are HIV positive or AIDS patients and those who are recent organ transplant patients are at an increased risk of this condition. Another important risk factor to make note of is that going to an area that has viruses, particularly viruses that cause encephalitis, is a risk factor for getting encephalitis. So exposure to infective vectors, which are oftentimes mosquitoes, in particular areas around the world that carry certain viruses that can cause encephalitis, that is a particular risk factor for getting encephalitis. So again, mosquitoes and even some other wild animals, particularly bats. So exposure to those types of infective vectors is a risk factor for getting this condition. What are the causes of encephalitis? Viruses are actually going to be the most common cause of encephalitis. So if it is a viral cause of encephalitis, it is called viral encephalitis. So again, encephalitis is most commonly caused by a viral infection, and it is estimated to account for approximately 70% of cases of encephalitis. One major virus that can lead to encephalitis is herpes simplex virus. And when this virus does cause encephalitis, we call it herpes simplex encephalitis. This is the virus that causes oral herpes or cold sores, or it is a very common virus that can lead to encephalitis in some cases. West Nile virus is also another cause of encephalitis, and there are many other mosquito-borne viruses that can cause encephalitis, so that means that these are viruses that are carried by mosquitoes. Some of these viruses include dengue virus, the equine viruses like West and East equine virus, St. Louis virus, Zika virus, and Japanese encephalitis virus. And then there are other less common viral causes of encephalitis. These include enterovirus 71 or EV71, poliovirus, Epstein-Barr virus or EBV, cytomegalovirus or CMV, measles virus, mumps virus, rubella virus, rabies virus, and herpes zoster virus. So many different viruses that can cause encephalitis. Now these aren't the only causes of encephalitis. There are other causes as well. These include toxoplasmosis, which is a protozoal infection. Cerebral aspergillosis, which is a fungal infection. This can cause encephalitis in some patients. T-cell lymphoma, which is a particular type of cancer. This can lead to an encephalitis as well. Certain metabolic encephalopathies can also lead to encephalitis. And then there is anti-NMDA receptor encephalitis, which has been infamously termed brain on fire. And this is actually a condition that may be a paraneoplastic syndrome, which would be something that is caused by an underlying cancer. We're going to talk a bit more about this later on in this lesson. Now let's talk about the pathogenesis of encephalitis. The pathogenesis of encephalitis actually depends on the etiology. Now we're going to focus on viral causes of encephalitis here because these are going to be the most common causes. Most viruses undergo hematogenous spread. So a lot of them are going to be mosquito-borne viruses. So a patient gets bitten by a particular mosquito that carries a particular virus and that virus multiplies in the bloodstream. And then that virus eventually enters into the spinal cord and can infect the brain parenchyma or the brain tissue. So that is one mechanism. And the other one is neuronal transmission. So there is a virus that has infected a particular tissue in the body, enters into a neuron. Most often it remains dormant within that neuron. And then something triggers it to cause a transmission through that neuron to the brain. So those are the two main mechanisms of transmission of this condition. Now with regards to hematogenous spread, most viral agents, actually almost all viral agents, will spread to the central nervous system via hematogenous spread. So again, most will actually multiply, travel through the bloodstream, and enter into the central nervous system infecting the brain. So that is what most viral agents will do. However, there are a few viral agents that will transmit to the brain via neuronal transmission. 
These ones are going to be important to remember because these are the viruses that do undergo this type of transmission. These include herpes simplex virus or HSV, herpes zoster virus, and rabies virus. These are the viruses that will utilize neuronal transmission to enter into the brain to infect the brain and cause encephalitis. So oftentimes these viruses like HSV will reside within neurons and then they may undergo retrograde transmission. So if the HSV or herpes simplex virus is located in a neuron that is inside someone's lip, for instance, it may undergo retrograde transmission going back through the neuron back into the brain to infect the brain. So that is a particular way that HSV and some of these other viruses can lead to encephalitis. What ultimately happens in both cases is that viruses invade brain tissue, and then this triggers a host inflammatory response to the virus, and then this leads to disrupted neuronal activity. So all of these things play a role in why signs and symptoms and complications occur from encephalitis. Now let's talk about the clinical features of encephalitis. Oftentimes there's going to be a prodrome to this condition. So before the full onset of encephalitis, there are often signs and symptoms that occur before. These include headache, myalgias, which are muscle aches and pains, and malaise, so a feeling of generally being unwell. These are oftentimes due to one of those viral infections we talked about before. Once a patient has had some of these prodromal symptoms, they will undergo a worsening of symptoms over hours to days. This can include a fever, so they'll generate a fever, and then they'll have altered mental status. This is going to be key with regards to this condition. So this altered mental status is going to present as confusion, altered sensorium. Oftentimes the patient is going to have a changing or different personality. So the family members of that patient may describe that patient as being different than usual. So a lot of these things can occur with encephalitis. So altered mental status along with the fever and the headache are going to be key findings with patients who have encephalitis. Patients can ultimately progress into more severe stages like seizures and coma, and they can also have focal neurologic deficits as well. So with regards to focal neurologic deficits, patients may have issues with functioning of a particular limb, for instance. So that may be a finding of a focal neurologic deficit, which can be a finding in strokes or brain abscesses as well. Now, there are other features that can occur in encephalitis. If the meninges, the covering of the brain in the spinal cord, if the meninges are affected, this can lead to meningitis. There may be a spreading of the infection and inflammation into the meninges causing meningitis. This can lead to signs and symptoms of meningitis as well. These include nuchal rigidity, which is a stiff neck. There may also be Brzezinski's sign, which is a clinical finding. And there may be Koenig sign, which is also another clinical finding. So with regards to Brzezinski sign, this occurs when a patient lies flat and passive flexion of the neck, so if the clinician actually pulls up on their neck, passively flexing the neck for the patient, there is involuntary flexion of the hips and the knees. So that would be a positive Brzezinski sign. And then with regards to Koenig sign, patient is lying flat, the clinician flexes the hip to 90 degrees, and then when the clinician attempts to extend the knees, there is resistance to that extension. So those are two signs that can be found with meningitis, or what would be known in this case as meningoencephalitis. Nausea and vomiting can also occur as well, and then there can be photophobia and phonophobia, so sensitivity to light and a sensitivity to sound. Now, there are some other associated symptoms of encephalitis depending on the underlying cause of the encephalitis. If it is the herpes simplex virus that is leading to encephalitis, that would be HSV encephalitis. And if it is HSV encephalitis, the patient may have a history of cold sores or oral herpes. And then the way HSV actually infects the brain, it undergoes retrograde transmission. It actually infects the temporal lobes most commonly. This can lead to memory issues in these patients and or aphasia, which would cause the patient to not be able to communicate coherently. With regards to EBV encephalitis or Epstein-Barr virus encephalitis, patients may have lymphadenopathy in splenomegaly, so enlarged tender lymph nodes and an enlarged spleen. In the case of Japanese encephalitis virus encephalitis, these patients often will have Parkinsonian features. So they can have tremors, they can have shuffling gait, so it may mimic Parkinson's disease. And they can also have asymmetric lower limb paralysis. 
In the case of EV71 or enterovirus 71 encephalitis, these patients can have issues with pulmonary edema, tremor, and myoclonus. And in the case of anti-NMDA receptor encephalitis, they can have symptoms of an underlying cancer. Oftentimes, the cancer that can cause this to occur is an ovarian teratoma. So oftentimes, it's going to be a young female patient who has this type of encephalitis. It is anti-NMDA receptor encephalitis, and it is actually caused by an underlying ovarian teratoma. How is encephalitis diagnosed? Oftentimes, it's going to be a clinical diagnosis because determining the underlying cause of encephalitis is extremely difficult. There are so many viruses that can cause this condition that it can be very, very difficult to actually determine what virus is actually causing this condition. Neuroimaging and lumbar puncture are important though. So neuroimaging with CT scan or MRI of the brain is important. What can be noted is that there can be low density lesions within the temporal lobes, which may be indicative of HSV encephalitis. We talked about HSV having a predilection for the temporal lobes. PCR analysis can also be undertaken for detection of HSV1 and HSV2. And then a CSF analysis or a cerebrospinal fluid analysis from the lumbar puncture can be important. So oftentimes what's going to be found is normal glucose level, elevated proteins in moderate lymphocytosis. However, there's a subset of encephalitis patients that actually have a normal CSF. It's also important to assess the opening pressure on a lumbar puncture as well. And an EEG may be important if it is suspected that it is Japanese encephalitis virus that is causing the encephalitis. So there are particular findings with an EEG if it is Japanese encephalitis virus. So how do clinicians treat encephalitis? The treatment actually depends on the underlying etiology. Most underlying etiologies actually have no specific treatments. There are a few exceptions to this. HSV encephalitis can be treated with acyclovir. So IV acyclovir can be very, very important with patients who have HSV encephalitis. Varicella zoster virus encephalitis may also be treated with acyclovir, although it may not be as effective. CMV encephalitis can be treated with gancyclovir and foscarnet. In immunocompromised patients, steroids may be given. If there is increased intracranial pressure on serial measurements, which we talked about before in the last slide, if there is increased ICP on serial measurements, this is associated with a poor prognosis. In this case, steroids and mannitol may be used, but most often treatment is going to be supportive in nature. So oftentimes the underlying cause of the encephalitis is not going to be known. But because viral encephalitis is going to be the most common cause and HSV is one of those main causes, clinicians are often going to utilize acyclovir as a treatment empirically. They may not know that the patient has HSV encephalitis or some of these other causes we talked about before, but they're going to do this anyway because acyclovir can be very important in the recovery if the encephalitis is caused by HSV or varicella zoster virus. So very important to recognize as well. If you want more information on meningitis, please check out my lesson on that topic. And if you haven't already, please like and subscribe for more lessons like this one. Thanks so much for watching and hope to see you next time.